mini episode 1196 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at Sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1196. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here. And we have one of our favorite, I can now not just say guests, he's not a guest anymore, an FDH Lounge dignitary as we uh, brought him into the family previously. <laughs> and also, what an amalgamation, FDH Lounge dignitary, fitness expert, pop culture expert. Uh, it is the latter that we end up uh, drawing upon here whenever we bring him on after an awards show. You can count on us doing this after the uh, uh, Emmys every year and also the Oscars. And of course, this time of year, that's what we're doing. It's the 2020 Academy Awards, our review with our friend, the one and only, the legendary John Baystow, coming back in to talk about it. Uh, it is uh, an annual rite of winter. Uh, John, I don't know how it coincides with if the groundhog sees his shadow or not, but right about this time of winter, we are getting together here to break down the Oscars, and it is, uh, it is always a highlight of my calendar, John. I look forward to it. I know as you do, too. Well, I just can't get past uh, the title uh, FDH dignitary. <laughs> um, that just that just is a, that just like all the, that, that just screams win. That is everything extra plus a little more, much like uh, much like uh, Billy Porter's outfit at the Oscars. Yes, everything re- extra plus <laughs> a little more. Very much so. Yeah, and uh, well. You know, since since you started there, that's that's one of the places we always look at is the uh, the red carpet. And you just happen to single out something that was uh, very interesting as far as an outfit goes. But I had in my notes just overall, generally speaking, from doing kind of scan of the landscape that we've talked about this that the Oscars is always more restrained than the Emmys and some of these other award shows. Certainly the MTV Music Awards, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Seem to be kind of, you know, classic looks again this year, and a little bit of weird stuff here and there, but it seemed like they were kind of keeping it to a minimum. What was catching your eye? Yeah, no, I, th- I think it's right. It's definitely, it definitely watered down when you compare some of the Grammys, and especially the MTV Movie Awards, or the MTV Music Awards, either one of them, uh, which, is, which, is, which is amazing. Uh, I mean, this one you have to really stretch. I mean, sometimes they'll say, somebody looks like window grapes. Or, or sometimes they'll say somebody looks like, um, you know, a, 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 a high-tech attendant at a um, pit crew or something like that. <laughs> but, um, but, but, I mean, that's very mild considering, like, the extraterrestrial and the all, all sorts of flora and fauna that you see in some of the other award shows. But, but I have to say, Janelle Monet, who I think is absolutely stunning, uh, all the time, in every way, all day, slay, slay, slay away, um, was amazing with the uh, hooded, like, uh, Swarovski crystal ensemble that she had. I thought she looked amazing. I thought she could be seen from space, and deservedly so. Yeah, I mean, she managed to stand out, and I agree with you. That was very much to her credit that uh, she was able to do that. And, uh, you know, you, you talk about uh, the MTV Music Awards. Uh, it's almost as though there was a portal here that somebody stumbled through, but it ended up being the 2020 Oscars instead. We end up getting Eminem out there on stage performing a song from 18 years ago, the random moment of the 21st century, John. Uh, 100%, and I, I have absolutely no conception of time. I, I always joke around uh, that I gave up aging one year for Lent and then just never picked it back up. <laughs> so I didn't even realize that that was 18 years ago, that uh, Lose Yourself, uh, you know, won an Oscar, um, and, and it was awesome to see him uh, do that performance, and I thought that was definitely, definitely one of the highlights of the show. It was, and you know, when you go through the musical stuff, there was, of course, the meme that came out of Billie Eilish uh, kind of responding to a couple of the Saturday Night Live gals going through their kind of hokey routine, but it was kind of funny, too, that 
you know, this same girl who I think it came out a couple months ago, like she didn't know who Van Halen was. She's the one they picked to perform yesterday when they're doing the in memoriam thing. Did they have to explain to her who the Beatles are? <laughs> well, that just goes to show you that uh, the Oscars, even though it was, uh, according to what I read after the fact, the lowest rated Oscars in history or yes. something, and even much lower than last year. Um, the Oscars always want to grab the names that have buzz, and I don't think you can grab a name that has more buzz right now than Billie Eilish. That is true. I gotta say, now this regardless is regardless of the fit, regardless of the fit, and I know exactly where you're going with it. Um, well, yeah, of the fit, and I, I think they also, I think they also probably did it in part because of the, the the whole Van Halen thing that you were talking about, and the fact that she doesn't have a recollection of a lot of these icons in her industry. I mean, obviously she's very young. But, I mean, a lot of times even the youngest people in an industry have done a certain amount of research and have a certain amount of background in people that existed way before them. I mean, I, 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 never, I, I never met Harriet Tubman, but I learned about her in school, and I greatly respected and was blown away by the strength of a woman like that. You know, so, I mean, if you're in an industry of music, I would think you would know a lot of the legends, but that's beside the point. But I think that the Oscars, um, you know, did probably... Uh, you know, in the back of their mind, think, ooh, what's her singing yesterday? You never know what's going to come out of that. Okay, this is interesting. I'm going to follow you down this rat hole because I think I see you working here. So you're saying Billie Eilish doing that, that it was maybe a deliberate choice on their part because she had not really been associated with knowledge of historical figures or anything like that. In the Hollywood parlance, John, could this perhaps be stunt casting, having her be the one to do that? Basically, doing whatever casting you need to do to get buzz and get a headline. <laughs> so, that you can get, so that you can get eyeballs on your broadcast. Well, it worked. Uh, I, people were talking about it. Uh, people were talking about it again. And I thought you did a great job, though. I mean, I, I think I, I thought I thought her emotion and I thought um, you know her uh, performance of it. I thought it was very, very good. I mean, some, I, I read some things that maybe weren't as kind, uh, but I mean, overall, I thought it was excellent. And she's she's very talented, no question about it. Uh, I may be one of the few people who prefers. Uh, the Interrupters version of her breakout hit, Bad Guy, to uh, the one that she does. But then again, I'm one of three still three people alive on God's green earth that's still uh, cop still liking 90s style ska, so there you go. Uh, but anyways, no, she's very talented, and what I'm about to say is not at all her fault, but the In Memoriam thing. Do, does, does the Academy not employ anybody that even goes on, like, Wikipedia? I don't mean to be a I don't mean to be a sensitive Ohioan, John. Okay, I don't want to be the sensitive guy from Ohio. But Luke Perry and uh, Tim Conway alone being omitted from there. Look, I know they're better known for TV, but they're actors. It's not like they never did movies. I saw a uh, a McHale's Navy movie that Tim Conway was in. I have proof of it. So come on, it's not like they never did any movies. I, I, the, the, the fact that they can't get the fact-checking right from year to year on who should be on the in-memoriam thing is inexcusable. But they get, and they get nailed for it every single year. There's always somebody that they miss. I, don't, I, I, I can't remember a year uh, that the Oscars aired where there hasn't been backlash about the in-memoriam part. Yeah. Well, you know... You know, that being said, me being the huge rush mark I am, if somebody accidentally put Neil Pert on the list, I wouldn't have farted at it. It would have been nice to see him on there, even though, you know, outside of a concert film, I don't think he was ever in a movie. I would have taken it for what it was worth. But, uh, so you, you had that kind of stuff going on, and uh, again, and it was funny to see the two nearest things to a host as far as stature people out there doing an act and everything like that, Steve Martin and Chris Rock kind of goofing on not having a host for the show this year, second year in a row. A lot of jokes out there that Parasite wins in the year where there's no host, which, you know, that's kind of clever, okay. But uh, as far as the whole concept, I think we had talked about this clearly when it happened last year, of just what a weird kind of a deal it is, and it just, I, I think they even tried doing like the disembodied voice at one point, unless I'm thinking of the Emmys, uh, which I might be. But uh, some of the things that they've done to avoid having a host on there largely because they don't want anybody to fall, fall afoul of cancel culture on Twitter the way that Kevin Hart did. You know, it, it to me is just like, it's very, to me it's gimmicky to go that route. And they even had, you know, like, introducers to introduce introducers, which was just goofy. So, just weird. I, 
I, I saw I saw some comments about that. How the, one of the one of the things that they a lot of uh, you know a lot of the publications come out and a lot of the media comes out doing best and worst, not only best and worst dress, but also best and worst moments. Um, and the fact of having stars introducing stars, new stars introducing old stars, old stars introducing new stars. Um, you know exactly what you're saying about the hosting. It, to be honest with you, that doesn't bother me that much. I mean, I I don't I don't think it matters to me whether there's a host or not, whether there's a disembodied voice or not. I mean, a lot of times you can do anything in this world, especially in the media, and there's going to be somebody that complains about it. I mean, that doesn't bother me either way. I mean, because everybody is there to see the awards, and a lot of times the host of those events is a very thankless job, um, except for, you know, the ones that, and even when they get paid, they're saying that they get paid a, a low amount compared to what they normally would get paid. But, I mean, a lot of times people are, well, let's just get to the award. Let's just get to the award. So I think whatever they do in between awards um, is going to always get, you know, positive things and negative things, just like anything that's ever done in this world. Oh, I can very well believe it's a situation where they're probably getting little to no pay because it's the old mentality of, hey, kid, think about how much exposure you're getting for hosting this show, which just shows you that the, the folks who put on a war... Case. Well, yeah, exactly. Like uh, the, the 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 folks who who put on awards shows are probably overqualified to be pro wrestling promoters because that's the same mentality in this business. Pay you realize what kind of exposure you're getting for doing this? So nice to see that that works in Hollywood and, and, and as well. Know, and you know you also either die or get arrested for overexposure. So there you go. That's true. That's true. <laughs> it's a town that eats up a great many of them, and uh, you know from there it's a logical segue to. A gentleman who's been uh, much in the tabloids over a period of time uh, for a, a multiplicity of, of reasons. Uh, his great talent, his his great good looks, uh, the women on his arm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One Brad Pitt, who again I think probably exemplify. We've been talking about the particular balance of these award shows in the Trump years, and you finally get to the 2020 election year. And what was it going to be like? And it wasn't politics start to finish. These shows, on the whole, 2017 to 2020, have been a little more restrained than what you figured they would have been, just because I think we all figured it would have been just, you know, rage and bile start to finish. Uh, so it's been a little bit more restrained than that. But uh, very interesting to see. This is the last guaranteed crack that any of them had at Trump while he's in office, albeit you know, just in my own opinion, the way the Democratic field is unfolding. They may have four more years of him to kick around, but, uh, oh, yeah. you know, for, for, for what was their guaranteed last crack, the last time they knew they were going to get him in office, again, outside of Brad Pitt, you had Phoenix with the, you know, uh, acceptance speech, but uh, there was a little bit of that, but maybe, maybe, again, much like the last couple of years, not as much of that as I might have expected. Well, you were I mean, eventually, one of the definitions of insanity, or at least, uh, you know, that people always quote as a definition of insanity, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I mean, the more Hollywood and the more the media try to vilify Trump and try to defame him, the better he does. I mean, it just doesn't work, uh, is it, the thing. I mean, as far as activists, so, I mean, it's, it's, and it also gets a lot of people just angry because it makes you look very, very petty. I, there was something, Joaquin Phoenix's speech, I actually thought, I know he got plan for it, and they were talking about him going off topic and him doing, um, he, you know, rambling and stuff like that. I actually thought he was more on point this time, especially when he's talking about the artificial insemination of cows and stuff like that, which is what I took away from it. I'm like, well, he actually had some valid points, um, regardless of what a lot of people said. Uh, and, and, and he, he's right about a certain things there. Sometimes he just goes completely off the rafters, but this time I'm like, I was sort of with him during a lot of his speech. Oh, yeah, no, I know what you mean on that, and I, I think this is something that we've talked about previously during awards shows the last couple of years. I don't remember exactly, but the sense that I'm getting, and from what you're saying, it kind of backs it up, is maybe a little bit of pragmatism on the part of Hollywood of knowing how well Trump did in flyover country last time, you know, the battleground mm -hmm. states, the states out mm -hmm. there, a fear potentially of alienating people by being too heavy-handed. Do you think some of that was at play as far as a lot of punches being pulled? Yes, they have. Okay. So they have. I yeah. mean, a lot of times politics doesn't belong in entertainment. I know right. a lot of people like to, there's a lot of egos in the media, there's a lot of egos in everything, but it's hyperbolized in the media. Um, and when you are on a stage and you're having the endorsements going from winning an award or being nominated for an award, you like to say a lot of things. Right. And the thing is, you realize sometimes when you say those things, nowadays people have them forever. 
and you sometimes sound like a fool, or you sound very petty, or you sound not like you thought you were going to come across when everybody's not with you. Um, and I think that I think that that makes people think twice. And also the fact that they've done it so many times, and so many times at award shows, and it's never really gone over well. I mean, a lot of times they cheer for themselves, which is fine. Um, but but I mean, it, overall, it, it doesn't get, get any results. It doesn't get them any closer to the goal that they have, regardless of what your politics are. It hasn't gotten them any closer to their goal. So try a different tactic. Otherwise, you're just stupid. Yeah, pretty much so. Again, if you're not persuading people, you're not accomplishing anything. Uh, you're, no, you're... But they, and then you also you ruin your brand because it makes it look like you have no impact. Well, exactly. You're saying too. the same thing and nobody's following you. So how good can you be? Yeah, I mean, you know what? That's an excellent point too. Yeah, you make you make yourself look impotent, and that is not good for your career in any form or fashion. And uh, you you look at that. You you look at uh, the ceremony this year and. Uh, the way that it went as far as uh, you, you, you do have these years sometimes where you get uh, sort of an unlikely film. Sometimes it's a foreign film as it was this year, breaking through for the best picture. Uh, Parasite being the one to, to get it. Some people were thinking, you know, it could be uh, 1917. A lot of people were thinking that. And, and that's, that's one, by the way, that I still got to get to see in the theaters because it, it does look cool as hell as far as the way that it's shot uh, and everything like that. But uh, there were some people that were thinking that, that it could be that. There were some people were kind of looking at uh, Joker, is that going to be the one? But, uh, you know, subsequently, it ends up being this film, and, and there, there's a little bit of a sense maybe that it could be a breakthrough for a movie like this uh, coming in and, you know, being uh, you know as, as, as absolutely, you know, foreign with a capital F as it could possibly be, it seems like, and, and, and winning it, so... You just wonder, you know, when you look at this historically, is it going to be kind of a one-off, or is it going to kind of set the stage for other films like that to break through? Yeah, I, I have no idea, but I have to say one thing. Um, I mean, I do like going to the movies. I love the escapism of movies. I love after, um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and when you're doing your own thing with, with certain things, I mean, you may work 24-7 over and over again, and then all of a sudden you just need to break, and, and, and my break is, is going to the movies. I do enjoy it very much, and just being aware of social media and seeing things. And I never even thought of seeing Parasite. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that after all that, it made me Google it, it made me find out more about it, and actually the story looks really interesting. Um, I'm also not somebody who's, who, who enjoys reading in any way, shape, or form. Right. I'm not reading subtitles. Uh, but, but I would like to now see that movie so that it persuaded at least one person. I also was really impressed with uh, the cast and everything of it, and how the, um, the director, uh, you know, the humbleness of the director, um, coming up and, and with the awards and some of his little funny quips and things, I thought it was just really cool, and it was just nice seeing, um, and he seemed very genuine. I mean, he could just be also a good actor as well as a director, but the thing is, he seemed very genuine in his complete surprise, complete joy, and it was just very refreshing, um, as opposed to a lot of times when you see canned speeches or when you see people that you can honestly hear feigning like, you'll see, for instance, and I'm not going to name who it is, but like you'll see somebody winning a music award, and every time she goes up and wins it, oh, my God, I can't believe I won. I know I won 1700 four, but I can't believe I won. It's just a surprise. I didn't. I have no clue. It's just amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, and, and this guy had such sincerity, and it, it was just, it was a nice, refreshing part of the show to see that uh, happen, and it definitely made me do a lot more research on that movie um, and, and be interested in seeing it. Absolutely, and I'll tell you what, this is one of these things where it's very disingenuous, as you say, when you get that kind of, you know, quote-unquote reaction about people being that surprised. But what you said about the thing being subtitled, you talk about barrier to entry, at least for somebody like me, I freely admit that that is going to be an issue because, uh, again... Oh, barrier to entry. I, I can't read much more than TV Guide. I well, mean, I, my yeah. friends have written books. I, I can write a book, but I won't read a book. I don't find any pleasure in it at all. And I have, uh, and it's funny because I've listened to um, Gary Vaynerchuk, and he says the same exact thing. And I think we're the only two who talk about it publicly um, about it. But I, I cannot. I, there will always be something more important to me than sitting down and reading. I just cannot do it, and I do not enjoy it. For research, yes. If I have to read something because I'm reporting on a story, I'm all over it. But for pleasure. Never. Well, I, if I have to research, I, if I have to research a, a, a condition my dog has, I will be all over it. But you sit down reading a novel, of what's the last book you read for pleasure? I would say never. I have never read a book for pleasure. 
That's interesting, because I, I, I'm the opposite in that regard. I've read for pleasure my whole life, but in, in terms of the practicality of it, I am one of the world's greatest multitaskers. So one of the things that gets me through all of the work I have in my life is my endless capacity to stream stuff. I can't stream stuff with subtitles, John. I might be a good multitasker, okay? But, you know, if I'm trying to keep my eye on something else, I can't be sitting there reading your friggin' screen. So, yeah, that when and if I get around to seeing that one, uh, that day is probably nowhere near. But, uh, you know, it was... It was interesting to, to, to see uh, that that one ended up getting it. There were some people that thought for a period of time perhaps that the Irishman might make it a little bit of sense that uh, Scorsese, a little bit later on in his career, trying to put out one more big epic and going the route of uh, going through Netflix, which has been sort of the trendy way the last couple of years to take their money and uh, give them the primary rights to it. Uh, that one did not end up uh, coming through in the end, and that's got to be a great disappointment, not only to him, but to Netflix also. I, that's, and, and what's interesting about that, I actually have um, two friends of mine, and I, I was in actually a movie with both of them, um, who were extras, uh, or uh, under under bonds or whatever, in The Irishman. I don't even know if, they, if their part was included mm. in the final thing, but I remember, I remember when they were shooting The Irishman, the parts that were being done here in New York. Um, and they were explaining to me um, what was being done with it, which is a totally innovative thing. I mean, it's a very long movie. I don't, it, even when it came out, I don't even remember it being in the movies for any length of time at all. It was almost like a Netflix original production in the sense that, you know, it debuted on Netflix at the same time. And, and by me, it was in and out of the movies for the blink of an eye. Um, and it was trying, I, I think it was an effort to show the power of Netflix to make a, uh, I guess, a uh, full blown, major star studded motion picture uh, you know a huge success and in that case I guess what you're talking about when you say it's falling short because it didn't win all those awards in any way shape or form and then a movie like Parasite comes up and you know eclipses all that attention um, it shows it didn't work but I mean I'm just, I think there's probably also a lot of backlash and negative feeling in the industry about Netflix because it has stolen so much steam from other things and this was one thing they weren't going to give them necessarily. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I could see you being right about that as far as the motivation of some of the voters. I will say this, as far as that goes, the notion of watching it in there, and this is yet another area where I'm an outlier. I don't mind watching stuff on my tablet or even my phone. I'm not one of these snobs that has to watch something on TV. I realize how big of an outlier I am. So about a month or so ago, eh, maybe this was longer, but I'm at my, at my monthly Texas Hold'em Club, and the, the subject of the Irishman was being bandied about. And I, I remember I said about the whole thing about it being in the movies. I'm like, what kind of a jerk-off is going to go see it in the movies when it's going to be on Netflix next week? Whereupon my good friend, fellow FDH lounge dignitary Tom Denk, says, actually, I was going to take my son to go see it. I said, well, I guess I have my answer. So, you know, there are people who wanted to see it in the theater. But, you know, I, I don't know why you would if you have a Netflix subscription, but, uh, of course, it looks cooler. But, but for, for the love of God, we're not talking Ford versus Ferrari here, okay? I saw that in the theater, and I understand why you want to see it in the theater. The Irishman? Eh, I don't care what screen I see it on, but that's just me. Uh, no, I, as, as I said, I understood it, and that's why I think, it also, I think that movie also, you know, probably, it, it doesn't appeal to every one of you. It was funny, there was one... Um, once again, one of my friends is also uh, produces and directs movies, and he's always in contact with uh, Netflix or Amazon and stuff like that. And I know one of the, um, I don't know if it's called an aggregator or distributor or whatever, but a lot of times a Netflix or a Netflix, you know, works with only a certain amount of sources for movies. Mm -hmm. and one of these people that he was trying to get in with, so he would have it in with Netflix, um, said, if you don't have a Marvel movie, we have no interest in you. And they go, that's the only movie that people want to see in the theaters now. Wow. And that was from somebody in the industry. So, um, you know, because, and they do do extremely, extremely well in the theaters. But, I um, mean, it just goes to show where, uh, once again, we always talk about this on every show we do, but it's where the eyeballs are at. It's not about what should be. It's not about what was. It's not about playing the game by any of those rules. It's like you have to deal with what is. Yes. And right now, there are certain things. Billy Eilish gets eyeballs, and she's on the Oscars. You know, uh, Billy Porter, a good example, um, is, is somebody who's been in this industry for years, 
but is now a star. Yeah. It's like, what, a 30-year overnight success type thing, I suppose. So it, it's not about, you know, what should have been or the amount of effort you put in it that when he catches fire and just going with it and going where the eyeballs are. So uh, the, the, the game for anybody in this industry who's trying to uh, get started or make a name for themselves is they have to do something different, not follow the herd, not be sheep because sheep get slaughtered and usually live horrible lives before that also. Um, but they've got to do something that stands out as special, and it may be something that everybody else laughs at. It may be something that everybody else says it's going to go nowhere, but it's something different because you never know when that something different is going to catch a spark and you get everybody's attention, and then everybody wants to beat you. That's it, exactly. And before we turn our attention to talking about somebody who fits the pattern of what you're talking about with all of that, i.e. someone who is all of the above, an FDH lounge dignitary, a fitness expert, and a pop culture expert, <laughs> before we delve into that a little bit more, any other thoughts on the Oscars that we didn't touch upon? Um, well, actually, actually, for once, I got to see the whole thing uh, pretty much without, um, you know, having to just look at a, a bunch of pieces afterwards. I actually like, um, I, I like the, uh, what you, you talked about the Saturday Night Live people, uh, Maya Rudolph and Kristen Wiig, uh, mm -hmm. I thought they were very good at okay. their little, at, 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 at their little uh, you know, when they started uh, talking about how there's a lot of directors in there, and they started, like, acting out for when they're doing production design, and then they started <laughs> singing when they're doing costume design. Right. So they, I, I thought it was very cute, and I also think it was great for Kristen Wiig. Once again, I'm trying to think of two steps ahead. Kristen Wiig is about to appear as the main arch villain in Wonder Woman 1984. Huh, okay. Which is, which is way out of her, what you would normally think of Kristen Wiig ever doing. Yes. So um, I think it's I, I think it's just really cool that, you know, um, you know that, that movie's going to come out in, I think, a few months. I'm not sure exactly, but, but already the trailers are out. And it's already being seen in the previews in movie theaters and everything. So it was great to uh, see her on stage. So I, just, I want to see what happens with that, because she's already known as an extremely funny, um, uh, you know, actress. She's also known as a great writer and creator as far as uh, bridesmaids and stuff like that. But now she's playing an arch villain in a, well, not Marvel, but DC uh, franchise, uh, which is so out of the realm of what you would expect somebody from Saturday Night Live to be doing necessarily. Of course, there's Robert Downey Jr. too, who, uh, you know, is Iron Man. But, um, you know, seeing, uh, I, I would never have expected them to cast, like, Kristen Wiig in this particular part, and I'm looking very forward to seeing what happens with that and what happens with her career after that, as a matter of fact. Well, it probably going to keep going straight up uh, after something like this because the the number of people who break through into major comic book movies uh, who don't do well is just about zero so yeah this will probably you know what, whatever career ascent she was still on is is probably going to have a massive spike right about at this point so I would agree with you uh, on that uh, and uh, you know as uh, the, other point, the other point I wanted to say was Cynthia Erivo I thought was uh, first of all I thought she was killer in the whole fashion of the, um, you know, in her outfit for the uh, Oscars. Um, I thought that was really cool. She even had a little bit of the Angelina Jolie leg popping out of her dress, which was a smart move. Um, but I think she stole the show on a lot of things, but especially on her song, uh, singing the, uh, you know, the Freedom Song, um, which what it's called, Stand Up, Yeah. Uh, from, um, from, um, from uh, the Harriet movie. I thought that was awesome. And I thought she did an amazing job, and I think the best part of it was, I don't know if you saw the end, but when she finishes, she doesn't like bow, I didn't see a bow, I didn't see anything, but when the camera does like a slow pan around her, she just has an empowerment face on, really like game face, stern, and then as the camera turns away and is about to go to commercial, she just does a little wink into it, but I thought it was just so empowering, so just a cool way to end that performance. Just that quiet elegance and that quiet strength I thought was awesome. Yeah, probably something they covered in the production meeting as far as how to capture her at that point but yeah it worked it, it totally worked and uh it, it created the moment that you're uh talking about no question about it uh as promised uh here a second ago so uh folks of course when they go to uh john .net or at john Bastow on twitter of course these are excellent hubs to find out what's going on with you uh, as you are described on twitter uh, TV internet personality, health uh, lifestyle expert, TV host, motivational speaker, author, and creator. We talked a little bit uh, off air uh, about uh, some of the more recent TV host type stuff here. But uh, again, uh, all these things popping with you constantly 
Uh, and as the little uh, graphic on your Twitter page says, motivation, fitness, pop culture, you got it all working, my man. I, I think the motivation comes into all, that's the one thread that's common. They really, uh, the things that I do have almost no uh, like, like intersecting uh, concentric part of the circles. Uh, you know, the, the fitness and then doing pop culture and stuff like that and then doing news reporting. Uh, you know, it, the one thing that does tie them all together is the motivating aspect. And what I mean by that is always follow your bliss. Whatever makes you happy. Happiness is not only the new success. Happiness has always been success. It's not money. You've got to figure out what you love to do and then find a way to get paid for it so you can make a living. But if you have, if you are following your bliss and you're doing what you love, you are ahead of 99.9% of the population and don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. So that's, I think, the real thing that people have to do nowadays is follow their bliss, not ever give up on their dreams, believe in themselves, and don't ever settle for ordinary when they know they have the power to be extraordinary. Absolutely. A, a nice little clip there, motivational speaking, uh, to be sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, again, you are somebody who, again, uh, lives what you're talking about here with all these different things you got going on and, and the constant ability, uh, one of the things I really admire, uh, to reinvent uh, when 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 Vine was a thing, nobody was killing it harder than you were on there, and uh, if for no other reason than uh, your stuff was going great, Vine should still be around. But uh, from there to Instagram to everything else to now uh, the auction show, everything that you're you're involved with here, again, it's a very inspiring thing to way to to see the way that you continue to to seek out and make the most of these opportunities. It's, it, you, you, as a, it's what we were talking about before. You can't play the game by what should be. You can't play the game by what was. You have to deal with what is. And not only make the best of it, but become extraordinary at it. Uh, and also make it your own. Um, and that's, and, and, and you, you've got to follow what you love to do. And that's, that's really the key about it. And I love doing it. I'm, I'm posting now, as you mentioned, that auction show. It's called JB's Fantastic Find, something I never thought I'd be doing. But it's just hilarious. It's like a mix of like almost like home shopping mixed with stand up, mixed with talk show. And um, you know, it's just been something that I never even thought I'd be involved in, uh, but has grown into something really, really big and something that's been um, you know very successful and very enjoyable for me uh, from the inception. And it's so new. I'm just interested to see where that goes and what other opportunities that opens up. Absolutely. And then, of course, sticking with the fitness and obviously the motivation is the main thing and the stuff from Vine that you had mentioned with the weight of horse has moved over to Instagram. So, you know, continuing those things is really great because the platform may disappear, but you don't have to disappear with it. Absolutely. And I continue to say in any form or fashion, uh, anytime we continue to get the 7-Eleven Chronicles out there in, in greater circulation, I always pop for those things. And there is nothing that makes my nephew and nieces laugh harder to this day than when I pull up some of your gems, John. I've got to bring them back. I, you always inspire me to that because I do have to bring them back. It's just the new people. It's funny. The new people that are following especially in the Facebook following since that um, auction show, JB's Fantastic Find, airs on Facebook and Facebook groups, which are basically like channels, almost like how TV has channels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny because I have all these new people. I, if I bring back the 7 like, what the hell is this? But that's just the reason to do it. <laughs> it, it, it throws, it'll throw, so they have no, once again, that's very, this is all very in the past year, so it's all very, very new. Yes. So the people that are used to the 7-Eleven Chronicles, um, you know, would be, oh, they're great, it's back. And these other people would be like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, so, that, which is reason enough to bring them back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So whether it's that, so whether... Amazing. Well, whether it's that or fitness made simple, whatever, I am a full spectrum John Baystow fan. Uh, may I say, I appreciate it all, and uh, it's good to see any time that any of this can be uh, incorporated in. And like I said, look forward to continue to uh, see the reinvention uh, as it goes along, the new things you're going to be continuing to do, and uh, just appreciate so much having you as a friend of the show. Segments like this are always worth their weight in gold, and uh, I know how much fun we have doing them. I can't thank you enough. Well, uh, you know, the best monitor I have is FDH Dignitary. So. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And we will always regard you as such. Thank you so much, John Baystow, for a great uh, review of the 2020 Oscar Awards. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge Mini, episode 1196.